Oh, hello and welcome YouTube, Mr. Robinson back here with yet another brand new exciting video on Math Basic Course, and as always, it is an honor and a privilege to be serving you today as it is every day here in my virtual classroom. Step on inside as we start to learn how to use chords in section 10.3 in the Big Ideas Math Integrated Math 2 textbook. We are doing things with circles right now, and chords are a part of circles. I mentioned that in section 10.1, so let's look at chords and the plural aspect of them, what multiple chords do in a circle, what kind of relationships we have what kind of theorems there are, a lot of different things, maybe ones for me to learn or relearn as well every so often. These things get a little finicky, but as we talk about them, I think you'll make sense of them in a nutshell. Let's go ahead and check out the lecture portion, and if you want to find more of this stuff, the problem set and all timestamps and such, go to the description section down below and you'll see what's going on there. All right, we're going to use chords of circles to find lengths and arc measures. Great. Um, previous vocab, chord, arc, and diameter are used, nothing new at least not yet, uh, using chords of circles. Recall that a chord, guys, is a segment with endpoints on a circle. That includes the diameter. Diameter is a chord. Because its endpoints lie in the circle, any, chords divide, any chord divides the circle into two arcs. A diameter divides the circle into two semicircles. So diameter is a chord. You get a semicircle here and a semicircle here. Any other chord divides the circle into a minor arc and a major arc. If you divide a chord right here, you get minor arc, major arc. Remember, minor arcs less than 180, major arcs more than 180 degrees. We have some theorems. Let's take a look at what they are. Congruent corresponding chords theorem states in the same circle, or in congruent circles, we talked about that stuff in 10.2, two minor arcs are congruent if and only if their corresponding chords are congruent. So, you know, an arc has two points with them, and with those two points, that's where the arc starts and ends, a chord can start and end on the same one. So when they say their corresponding chords, they mean there's a segment AB and there's a chord, excuse me, there's a uh, segment AB, which is a chord, and there's an arc AB. There's a segment CD, which is a chord, and then there's an arc CD. If those chords are congruent, so are the arcs. And, um, let's see, is the converse, da, 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 da. two arcs are congruent if their chords are congruent, is what they're saying there. There's a proof, I suppose we have to do it. It says exercise 19, so look at that. If, uh... Arc GD is congruent to arc GF in this situation, then the point G and any line segment or ray that contains G bisects arc FD. Yeah, EG bisect. Okay, so you can have bisects. Oh, they're pointing down here. I thought this was more information about this. I'm like, yeah, that totally has nothing to do with this, but okay. All right, I'll go back to this one in a bit and see if I want to make sense or talk about it after. All right, uh, perpendicular chord bisector theorem. By the way, I'm not going to remember these names. I'm not going to remember these names. Uh, cor congruent corresponding chords theorem, perpendicular chord. I'll try. If a diameter t of a circle, diameter, like EG, is perpendicular to a chord, then the diameter bisects the chord in its arc. That's a very classic uh, proof one that you can do as well. Basically, these two parts are congruent here and here because this is perpendicular to it. It's also perpendicular bisector. A lot of things by nature that's going to happen with that uh, that we'll make sense of, but we'll also, of course, prove it later. Uh, that also then means that these arcs are congruent here, and I think that's what they're talking about right here. EG is bisecting arc FD, and uh, which would make these things congruent, and then at the same time, that's what happens when you have something perpendicular to that same chord that makes up that arc. It is bisected, the entire arc is, uh, arc is bisected. Uh, perpendicular chord bisector converse. So let's look at it the other way. If a chord of a circle is perpendicular bisector of another chord, then that first chord is a diameter. So not stating anything's a diameter yet, that'll be the conclusion, whereas this was if it's a diameter. Now we're saying if we got a perpendicular bisector, that means this guy must be the diameter of the circle where it passes through. And again, a proof to be had later. Let's look at some examples of some of the theorems they were talking about here. Uh, in the diagram here, circle P is congruent to circle Q, and we have a couple chords within. We have GF and JK that are also marked congruent. Measure of arc JK is 80 degrees. They say find the measure of arc FG. Well, if this is 80 degrees, this will all be, also be 80 degrees because you have congruent circles and you have congruent chords within those circles. And that's what they're saying here. By the congruent corresponding chords theorem, these two arcs will have the same measure. GF is going to be 80 degrees, or FG will be 80 degrees. Second example, using a diameter is part of this example. So let's find the length of HK, and we'll find the length, uh, the measure of arc HK as well. So the length is the length of the segment. Notice where it says find HK versus measure of. 
those are two different things there. Uh, measure of HK is going to be very, uh, segment HK is going to be a very simple one. This is seven right here. And since this diameter is perpendicular to this chord right here, that means these two are bisect, uh, it's bisected. So these are congruent. If this is seven, so is that, which is what they're saying. You double seven, you get 14. HK, the entire thing is 14. What about the length of this arc? Well, in this case, we also have something perpendicular to the chord, and this thing's bisecting this. Therefore, the arc is also being bisected. So these two parts are equal. 11x equals 70 plus x is the setup of that scenario. You solve for x and you get 7, and we can now substitute into either of these, like 11 times 7 is 77 degrees, and double that, because they're both the same, you get 154 degrees. All right, using perpendicular bisectors, uh, what's this about? Three bushes are arranged in a garden as shown. I think it's these things right here. Where should you place a sprinkler so it's the same distance from each bush? Well, to be the same distance from them, you need to have congruent radii here, right? So you need to get some sort of center. We've heard of that thing before. I think it was called circumcenter where the radii are congruent. Yeah. Um, so what do we do for that? It's perpendicular bisectors, I believe. Yeah. So label the bushes A, B, and C as shown. Draw segments A, B, and B, C. So they're kind of like connecting these with some segments, boom and boom. And then they're making perpendicular bisectors of these because wherever they intersect are considered to be the um, circumcenter of that thing such that you can have a circle that circumscribes these guys right here. It's drawn on this side here. Um, so wherever they intersect in our concurrent is that circumcenter, and that will make these the same distance away. A to the sprinkler, B to the sprinkler, C to the C sprinkler are all congruent. They're all radii and equidistant. Uh, okay, there's some monitoring progress, which I'll go ahead and skip. Let's keep moving forward. Let's look at the equidistant chords theorem. In the same circle or in congruent circles, two chords are congruent if and only if they're equidistant from the center. So E, G, and E, F, if they're the same length away, and remember distance is measured perpendicularly in this case, because then we can have this right frame of reference and it's the shortest distance. So if E, G, and E, F are the same length, then these two chords are congruent to each other. Now you might sit and wonder, you know, a lot of people ask, when are we going to use this in real life? I don't worry about that. That's, that's not the point. The point is, learn it. <laughs> uh, excuse me. The point is uh, that uh, circles have a lot of unique features with them. And there are a lot of things in science where you say, hey, isn't that cool? It's a lot of reasons like this that make them so. So that's not the point. <laughs> I just want to make sure I disclose that right now. I put it to bed. Using congruent chords to find a circle's radius. Let's go ahead and take a look based off the last theorem we saw. In the diagram, QR and ST are equal length. They're each 16, not marked, but written. CU is marked and labeled as 2x. CV is 5x minus 9. Find the radius of circle C. So them saying that QR and ST are the same, and they're both chords in this case, means that they also are congruent to each other. And if they're congruent to each other, then that means that these are going to be equal distance from each other. I don't know if they ever said that this has a converse. They did say if and only if. So that means that the converse is also true. So because they're equal distance, they're congruent. Because they're congruent, these are equidistant from here. So we get to set 2x equal to 5x minus 9. And that's the setup they're going to do. They solve for x and they get 3. When they substitute 3 into like 2 times x, they get 6 as the length of cu. Uh, the length of qu, qu right here is a little bit different. What they do is they construct a radius in this guy. Notice it didn't originally have one. Now a radius, a radius is also in this case, I should have said hypotenuse, but this radius is this length here, but it's also that length there, and it's also this length here, right? We have all those other things representing that length. But that radius they're going to use, let's see where they say that, the diameter's perpendicular. So this bisects this QR thing right here. Wait, what did the radius have to do with that? Oh, that's later. Gotcha, gotcha. They first have to find QU, I forgot. QU is right here. And uh, because these chords are congruent to each other, and because this guy's bisected right here, these are both the same. So uh, they have a length of Q, where is it? I'm trying to find it. They have a length of QR as 16. So half of that QU will be eight. I guess we could have known that earlier on. And, but because that's eight, and because this is six, you can now use Pythagorean theorem with this radius that's drawn to figure out that length's gonna be 10. Is that what they wanted? What, what was the, oh, because they want to find the length of CQ. CQ is a radius. Oh, yeah, so they need to draw that. So that's going to be the radius that's drawn. That's going to be 10 because by Pythagorean theorem, you can get 10 there. Sorry, again, I, I don't prep these 
if it's not obvious, I don't prep these things. So I just want to make sure that you understand I'm sight reading as we go that we're learning together there. But that's it for that example set. Now let's look at the official problem set here where the first question asks, describe what it means to bisect a chord. You do it. Um, to bisect a chord, I guess, well, I don't know what they want as an official answer. I'm thinking more so like in reference to the idea that when you have um, uh, like the diameter doing it, but just the idea to bisect a chord is the way to bisect any other segment. You're splitting it into two congruent parts. So split the chord into two segments of equal length. I thought they meant the ramifications of doing it when it comes to like the arc and what we tend to do with it, a radius or a diameter. I guess not. I'm just going to say that. All right. Second part says two chords of a circle are perpendicular and congruent. Does one of them have to be a diameter? Explain your reasoning. Give me one second, please. Uh, pardon me. Okay, uh, just a quick TMI thing. I felt nauseous there just a second ago. So if it happens again, you just know why I'm just like, just a second. Okay, I don't know where I was. Vocabulary and core concept checked. Uh, we answered number one. Okay, number two. Um, two chord and nothing happened. I was just saying that. I, just, I felt it and I was like, I got to pause. All right, two chords of a circle are perpendicular and congruent, does one of them have to be a diameter? Explain your reasoning. No. So if you have, if I have like a circle, boom, like that, let's see. I have this chord right here and this chord right here. They're perpendicular to each other, and I guess they don't really look congruent to each other. But they're perpendicular to each other. Now they look kind of more congruent, right? One doesn't have to be a diameter of the other. For them to do that, one needs to be a perpendicular bisector. Congruence isn't one of the requirements of that. So, no, um, because they don't necessarily bisect each other. I guess that's the way that I'd say it. I should have typed it. They don't, whoops, don't necessarily bisect each other. Okay, just because they're congruent and perpendicular means nothing for diameter. All right, guys, uh, let's go to the problem set. Now, I think it only goes to number 28, and hopefully that means less time uh, on my end, so we'll see what actually transpires here. Let's see what happens, shall we? Start with numbers 3 through 6, where you find the measure of the red arc or chord in circle C. Okay, number 3. We have now this this comes off the heels of section 10-2, if you recall. And in 10-2, we had central angles and what I call the intercepted arc. I don't know if this, I don't know if they say that here, but the intercepted arc of that central angle, if this is 75 degrees, so is this guy right here. Now, the important part that we want to look at is the fact that this chord ED is congruent to the chord AB. So AB's arc measure will be equal to ED's arc measure. So the measure of arc AB in red. Measure of arc AB is going to be equal to 75 degrees because of how ED is congruent to AB. They're not asking us why. I'm telling you why. I'm just not writing it. In number four, we need the chord. Find the measure. Oh, I didn't see the five. <laughs> I was just looking. All right, so there's a little red chord right there. It's very tiny. And then there's another chord that's right there, right? So uh, there's a five right here for the length of TU, and UV will also be the same. So number four, the length of UV is going to be five just because of the congruence of the chords as well. Number five, we have two chords that intersect each other uh, in such a way that they create congruent parts. Now, that's this is not a central angle. I just want to make sure you understand that. Not a central angle. But we do have vertical angles in these cases here, which would be congruent to each other for chords that are congruent. I mean, they split them up into a congruent parts, if you will, although they're congruent to opposite parts. But this like two plus one is the same as this two plus one right here. Not by numbers, but they're congruent chords. So these are vertical angles that are also congruent here. If that matters. I mean, I'm trying to think suddenly if that matters. Um, maybe. But anyway. With these things being congruent right here and these chords being congruent right here, then, you know, this is going to be the 110 degree. This is going to be a 110 degree measure. Um, or, 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 
maybe you don't need to talk about the vertical angles at all. Let's just refer to the chords and their arcs. This chords, this chords arc right here should be equal to this chords arc right there. How about that? Even better. But that still makes this thing 110. And you add the 60 degrees with it right there. So the measure, the measure of arc XZ, XZ is going to be 110 plus 60, which is 170 degrees. Let me box some of these here. Now, I only called it XZ. If you did learn about minor arcs and such from section 10-2, it's not a major arc. It bear, It's close to it, but this chord is not quite a diameter. It's a little less than, and you can tell it's 170 degrees, which does make it minor. So we only use two letters, not three. Last one here is number six. And on number six, we're looking for this chord length, this segment here. And we have, based on these seven uh, radii of length seven, these are congruent circles, and because they have congruent arcs from these points that are made, that means that the length of LM is the length of QR, so QR's length as an overall, the segment, will also be 11, just like that other guy. All right, let's keep moving forward. Let's look at numbers 7 through 10, where they ask us to find the value of X. Now we're going to, at least for number seven, I haven't looked beyond it, but now at least for number seven, we're going to be looking at a theorem that's used that when they say if a diameter is perpendicular to a chord, it also bisects that chord. So here, these two guys are congruent to each other, which means the value of X can be found to be eight. Eight. And I know I'm not really showing any work here, but there's really no work to show. Yes, I could say the GE equals EJ, but I made the marking on the diagram, and for our sake, I hope that that's enough. Number eight. Once again, we have a perpendicular guy here, but it not only bisects the chord, it also bisects the arc that that chord makes, or that the endpoints make to make the chord. So X is now an arc measure. X is 40 degrees, much like the measure of arc ST is 40 degrees, so is RS, and that is the value of X. Number nine has, once again, the all these have the perpendicular parts, so it's all about the bisecting. Here, we have to actually do some work to solve for x, but we do an equation where these are set equal to each other. These are congruent, and now we can say 5x minus 6 equals 2x plus 9. If I have any problems like this for 28 problems, I would be more than happy to go. I don't think the nausea is even going to kick in in that case. Subtract 2x from both sides, add 6 to both sides, and divide both sides by 3. You get x equals five. They just said find the value of x and that'll be it. And then number 10, once again, because the perpendicularity, you have these parts here. Now this time it's they're talking about the court of the uh, arc measures in degrees, but you're still setting those two expressions equal to solve for x. So this will be 5x plus 2 equals 7x minus 12. See what's great about these problems is even if you like kind of forgot what to do if you're going into a quiz, whatever, you're like, well, I can give it a shot and just set them equal and see what goes. That's not really something a math teacher should be saying. Um, but that's not 24, that's 14. But my point of that is well, they kind of look the same, even though you're not full blue in like the, the theorems and stuff and proving them. I think you can make sense of the fact they'll be equal from what's there. So that's kind of nice. Now, there are some theorems that don't work exactly like that or some formulas. So just be ready for all the new, new stuff on top of that as well. All right, let's go to number 11. Describe and correct the error in reasoning. So they said because segment AC bisects segment DB, then BC, arc BC, is congruent to arc CD. A lot of this kind of sounds right with a the theorem that we heard, but there's one major problem here is that AC is not shown to be the diameter. It could be, but there's no guarantee of it. So arc AC is not expressed as a diameter when this would be true, when this would apply. So, I mean, correct it, how, how to correct it as such, it's more like saying if you knew AC was a diameter, then you could say this is true, or we cannot necessarily guarantee this is true. I don't like when they say correct the error because it makes me think like they're saying, redo the problem with the error not in place. Well, the error not in place now says that AC, it doesn't say that AC is a diameter. So now without saying that, I just make the conclusion that BC is not necessarily congruent to CD, and arc CD. 
Otherwise, yeah, it would work out in that way. But yeah, it looks like BC is a little longer than CD, but we don't know what's drawn to scale and what's not. All right, let's keep moving forward to number 12 where we hit some problem solving, a word problem. In the cross section of the submarine shown, the control panels are parallel and the same length. So we're looking at, if you can tell, sometimes I can't even tell on my own um, thing here, but we're talking about this little circle and they said cross sections that are parallel. They're referring, it looks like, to this and to this right here. Okay, so those guys, I'm just highlighting in yellow. They said in the same length. Uh, describe a method you can use to find the center of the cross section, justify your method. Um, well, given that they're, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking my justification in just like my own way, but again, I'm just gonna do a rough version of it. So parallel and congruent. My thought is intersect this segment with this segment, and then boom, you found the center. Um, I'm trying to determine if the justification should be anything regarding circle items or just more the fact that I can use other reasons like, you know, angle, angle, or, you know, like triangle congruence things basically. Um, but referring to a center, oh, you know what we're probably diving into now next is the congruent chords and equidistant length. So I did say where they cross would be fine. That does work. But... These two chords are also equidistant from the center. Okay, I think that's what they want to start talking about. So what I would do is I would draw perpendicular bisectors to these guys right here. Perpendicular bisector here and right here would find that center, I suppose, or at least the center would be on it. I know I'm not explaining this great. Um, the center would be on the perpendicular bisectors of these guys. It still wouldn't tell you exactly where the center is. I guess drawing these diagonals through would really help. My reasoning is not coming through, but basically you have congruent triangles here. They're isosceles triangles that go through and they meet at the center. But if they're talking about the part of these being equidistant from these two places, you could do it as well. Um, they did say see example three. I don't know. I'm trying to think if I should go to example three with it. What if you, I, I mean, I, I like the intersection of those two working. It just doesn't really explain what we're doing with circles and chords and stuff. But draw, draw uh, two diagonals that intersect each other from chords on opposite sides. The point of intersection is the center. I'm, I'm more leaning to the, I'm, I'm more so actually leaning to the other one where you draw the perpendicular bisector of these. The problem is finding that center right in the middle. I guess you find a midpoint. Depends on if you're doing compass construction or using a ruler or something like that. But the midpoint between those. When I said draw a perpendicular bisector, you got to find their midpoint anyway. That's why I'm saying those two lines would really help. I'm living on that problem too long. I'm just going to go ahead and move onward. Hope that's okay. In exercises 13 and 14, determine why there's segment AB as a diameter of the circle. Explain your reasoning. So there's a converse of the theorem that we referred to when something's perpendicular. And we stated if, oh, how do I say it? We stated if uh, diameter is perpendicular to a chord, then it's going to bisect that chord. Now they're saying we have to figure out if AB is a diameter based on figuring out if this chord is perpendicularly bisecting this chord. So that's the question. Is it perpendicularly bisecting it? Uh, if I make mark some drawings on here, what I want to do is indicate, yes, these two parts here are congruent. Oh, this uses, do you remember this one? Hold on. No, that can't be used yet because we don't have anything perpendicular. But we have these sides congruent, these angles congruent, and by reflexive property, this side's congruent to itself. Therefore, the triangles here are congruent. This is kind of a proof. Triangle A, oh, I can't give it its name because there's no letter there. But these two triangles are congruent by side angle side, which means these two sides are congruent here by CPCTC. And then these two angles are congruent. They form a linear pair, so they make right angles. Therefore, because this is a perpendicular bisector, AB, because CD, no, because AB perpendicularly bisects CD, then AB is a diameter.
by the converse of the something theorem. By the converse of the something theorem, of, of the theorem. Come up with the names. I said I'd remember them, and I have no idea what they are. I'm sure there's more to this that we could have stated, but when they show the congruent angles, I think I wanted to lean in on that more. But these congruent chords means these two are congruent to each other here. I, I feel like there's just more that we could say on that, but uh, I'm going to leave it as it is. All right, let's look at the next one. Now, you don't go based off of appearance, but I'm guessing this one's a no. I'm guessing E is not a center in this case. But number 14, we have... These two guys congruent here is 3 and 3. A right angle shows 5, therefore this guy here is 4. If this guy here is 4, then this isn't bisect. AB is not bisecting CD. AB is not bisecting CD despite the fact that it's perpendicular to it. Therefore, not, not. AB not bisecting CD. So, not a diameter. That's his diameter. All right, number 15 and 16, find the radius of circle Q. So here's the equidistant stuff that I was referring to before. These two chords, these two chords have the length of 16. They're congruent to each other. Therefore, they are the same distance away from the center. They said find the radius of circle Q. Now, a radius goes from, let me find one, it goes from a point, the, the center point, to a point on the circle such as this. So we got to find something like the length of QE. We'll do that once we find X's value, plug that value in for X, and then find out a length of this part of that triangle right there. So I'll have a couple things to write on this, even with that drawing in play. First of all, I'm going to set 4X plus 3 equal to 7X minus 6. These are both the same length from those two congruent chords being equidistant. I can subtract 4x from both sides, add 6 to both sides, divide both sides by 3, I get x equals 3. Now, that's not an answer, but that'll help me lead to some information, such as I can find the length of QA. QA is 4 times 3 plus 3, which is 12 plus 3, which is 15. So as QA is 15, still not the answer, this is this length right here, 15. One of the legs of the right triangle. Another leg of the right triangle here is this perpendicular guy is perpendicularly bisecting this thing because this is technically a radius. Um, it's not technically a radius, but it's technically showing the equidistant part from the center and it's perpendicular to it. It will be bisecting that chord. So this 16 is split up into 8 and 8. So the length of EA is 8, 16 over 2. So we have two of the three sides of a right triangle. We have the two legs, 15 and 8. We need to find the length of QE, which is the hypotenuse of this right triangle. So QE squared equals 8 squared plus 15 squared. If you know your Pythagorean triples, you'll know that this is going to be 17. And... If you use Pythagorean theorem, you'll see that it's also 17. And that is what we're trying to find, the radius of Q. This is radius. This is answer. Answer, answer, answer. Okay, number 16. Number 16 has the same kind of thing, but now the algebraic expressions are on the outsides of these guys here. Um, these chords are not shown to be congruent but the distance to the chords are from the center are congruent. Therefore, the chords are congruent. So I can set those measures equal to each other. 4x plus 4 equals 6x minus 6. I can subtract 4x from both sides, add 6 to both sides, divide both sides by 2. I get x equals 5, not the answer. What I can do is take that 5 and substitute it into somewhere to find the length of, say, AD. AD is going to be 4 times 5 plus 4, which is 20 plus 4, which is 24. That is the length of either chord, AD or BC. 24 divided by 12, excuse me, 24 divided by 2 is 12, which is the length of any part of this 
chord, uh, any half of this chord like that, so this would be 12 for example. It's one of the legs of your right triangle, five is the other one, and the hypotenuse is right here. We need to find a radius, QD could be that radius. So if you have lengths of five and 12, we can get QD's length, the radius here, which will be 13, it's once again another Pythagorean triple. So QD squared equals 25 plus 144, QD squared equals 169, QD equals 13. 13, which is once again a radius of this circle. Okay. All right, let's go to number 17 on problem solving. An archaeologist finds part of a circular plate. What was the diameter of the plate to the nearest tenth of an inch? Justify your answer. The sevens, hopefully you can kind of see this. There's like a red, uh, there's a cord, and it says seven inches. And I assume the way that they're pointing down to it, they're saying it represents the entire cord. So this cord equals this cord. And then we have, they said part of a circular plate, what was the diameter? Oh, got it, got it, got it. So what we have is that those sevens, and you know, I'm only doing this based out because they don't have any points and letters and such. I'm dividing seven by two, taking half of seven, getting 3.5. So we can get the length of either of these parts here. They even mark them congruent. Boom, 3.5 like that. And what we can do here, we have this six and this right. It, once again, it's going to be a right triangle kind of thing. We're going to find out the radius length. I'm going to call this thing R. R. R is not the diameter, but it is half the diameter. And I don't know if that was taught, but I'm sure that's something that you already know. So this time we can say that r squared equals 3.5 squared plus 6 squared. You can see why they ask you to round to the nearest tenth, but do that in your final answer. So r squared, that's 12.25 plus 36, which is 48.25. And r is the square root of 48.25. I'm going to leave that for a second, because what I want to do is say that d, the diameter, is twice that of r. So it's 2 times the square root of 48.25. Now I'm going to go ahead and calculate that one. I'll not round early before that. I just want to get this one first out of the way. So 48.25 square root of and double that length. And I'm getting 13.89 about. So D is about how many decimal places? Nearest tenth, about 13.9 inches. What was this? An, a disk? A circular plate. Cool, cool. Number 17, cracked. Number 18, they want to know how we see it. What can you conclude from each diagram? Name a theorem that justifies your answer. So we got four parts on here. So part A, again, just referring to the diagram. I think I want to type these ones out, actually. I'll even type in A. A. Um, just overlap the written A. looks terrible um on the first one i can conclude that a b is a diameter i do not know i do not know the theorems let me pop them up i'm gonna i'm gonna find a pdf and pop it up this is the a perpendicular chord bisector theorem oh no wait this would be the converse it would be the perpendicular chord bisector converse. AB is a diameter by the perpendicular chord bisector converse. The converse states if you have a perpendicular bisector, such as this one right here, that one chord is a perpendicular bisector of the other, then it's a diameter. Now this should have a uh, the bar above it like that. Okay, that's part A. Part B, again, don't really know the name, the congruent chords theorem. Uh, the converse of it, rather. If we have congruent arcs in the in the same circle, then those chords are congruent. So I can conclude that AB is congruent to CD. Let me, again, search what this one would be. This is called the, I can describe it, equidistant chords theorem. Uh, really, though, it would be the, no, excuse me, not equidistant. What's the? It's the first one we did. Uh, congruent corresponding chords theorem. Uh, it would be, I guess, the converse of it, though by the converse of the congruent corresponding chords theorem. Okay. 
Okay, so that is segment. Were they segments? Where is it? Segment the chord. A, B is congruent to that one. So that's part B. Part C, they're making a how do you see it longer than it deserves to be. Part C, I can conclude, so that's a, J, J H is a diameter and it's perpendicular to F, G. So I can conclude that J, H bisects segment F, G. This is the original. This is not the converse, but the perpendicular chord bisector theorem. That does mean that those two parts are congruent, but the fact that it bisects it is what makes that so. So JH is bisecting segment FG, making those two parts congruent. And the last one, this is where you have that equidistance. Again, I forget the name, the equidistant chords theorem or something like that. Um, these two chords are the same distance away from the center. Therefore, these two chords are congruent. So part D, I can say PN is congruent to ML by the, I think it was called the equidistant chords theorem. Equidistant chords theorem. So let's let's see if that was the name. I'm gonna go back to figure out if that's true. Um, find it, it was the da, 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 equidistant chords theorem. Okay. All right, let's keep moving forward with that then. Let's look at number 19, proving a theorem. Use the diagram to prove each part of the biconditional in the congruent corresponding chords theorem. So we have parts A and B of a proof here for number 19. Um, I guess A, B, and D, C are our chords. And then we also have the arcs that we're referring to as well. So we have to, we have to prove, excuse me, these things congruent here. We're on number 19. I don't know if I want to do a two column proof or what when they say the given. I've really done things with arcs. I started on the last problem set. Uh, in section 10.2, but I think in this set, I think you can kind of just more paragraph proof it. So we have this given stuff. Should I copy and paste that? Let's see. Let's just copy and paste this whole set. I want the diagram so I can mark it up when I need to. So I'm going to say, boom, I got this. And let's, let's see where this takes us. Okay. A, B, and C, D are congruent chords. Prove that the arcs are congruent. So A, B, C, D congruent chords prove that that's congruent to that. All right. No problem, right? No problem. Okay. So I would say with this one here that since A, B, and C, D are congruent chords. Hmm. Here's what I'll do. They did make triangles. I, I was thinking hard about this. I'm like, why do they have these things here? All right, they have triangles. So let's prove the triangles are congruent. These two parts are congruent to each other, given. These are congruent to each other, all of them. They're all congruent to each other because they're all radii. Radii of a circle are congruent. Boom, 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 boom. So I'll just say uh, uh, PD, PD is congruent to PC, which is also congruent to PA, which is also congruent to PB radii, uh, congruent radii. Now you have two congruent triangles by side, 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 right? So I can say, and at least this one, they actually have the letters on them. So I can say triangle DPC is congruent to triangle APB by side, side, side. Now I kind of feel like I could have done two column proof with this. And if the triangles are congruent, then corresponding parts are congruent. Now the arc is not a part of the triangle. But these angles are, and these are central angles. So these angle P's, if you will, I don't know how to kind of fit this all together because am I cutting you off? Let me check. I didn't, yeah, okay, I can fit one more line. So angle D, P, C is congruent to angle A, P, B by C, P, C, T, C. Corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. And if these central angles are congruent, then they're, intercepted arcs are congruent, right? Those guys right there. I don't know the name of the theorem though, but that's what would bring that one up. So that last part is just saying, therefore that. Uh, therefore, seg uh, arc AB is congruent to arc CD. 
and again, that's just more of that last theorem. I don't really know the name. That's maybe why I don't want to do the reason stuff. But that's the uh, one that says what we saw in section 10 to. All right, that's number 19, part A. Number 19, part B, we're going to go the other way on it. Now that I have the arcs, I'm probably just going to go backwards on this whole stuff. So take the same diagram. Can I just kind of paste and then hide? Let me just take that thing, the figure. Woo. Let's take the figure. So let's just talk the opposite way of it. I won't write anything until we mark it up and talk about what we're going to do. This time, we know the chords are congruent. If the chords are congruent, then their respective central angles are congruent. Boom, like that and that. We know that radii of a triangle are congruent. So these are all congruent to each other, but most importantly, say this is congruent to that and this is congruent to that. So these two triangles are now congruent by side angle side, side angle side, and then therefore these two will be congruent by CPCTC. So we can start by saying uh, the given that CD is congruent to AB. That's kind of how they gave it to begin with. Boom. And then, therefore, those two angles in the middle are congruent. It's a central angle thing. So angle DPC will now be congruent to, mark those congruent first, and then these are congruent APC, angle APB, excuse me, APB, central angles from congruent chords. Now, radii are congruent here, so the same stuff as before. PD is congruent to PC, is congruent to PA is congruent to PB. Again, radii congruent. I'm saying these parts out loud. So now I have triangle DPC is congruent to triangle APB. That's side angle side. I'll go and write that one out. That's new. Uh, lastly, now we can conclude that these two parts are congruent here and here, which are the congruent chords. And I think they wrote it as AB, segment AB congruent to segment CD. CPCTC is happening there once the triangles are congruent. Okay, that's how I'm going to finish that one off and conclude it. I know it wasn't quite a two column proof. It wasn't, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know what stages we're supposed to really do them versus not. When I see the chords, I kind of, I shudder in fear because I don't know theorems by name. I just know theorems by math, if that helps. All right, mathematical connections. In circle P, all the arcs shown have integer measures. Show that X must be even. Interesting. The arcs have integer measures. Okay. So if the arcs have integer measures, there are three of them. And two of them must be congruent here. When I have this arc, when I have this congruent chord and this congruent chord, then these two guys are congruent together. Um, and this arc X also means that this is X as well. So What I can say is this, if these are each Y, if one of these is Y, then the other is Y. We don't know what they are themselves. So I'll just say that we have a concept that X plus the two Y's here equals 360 when you add those up all together. Now, if I divided everything by two, literally, you have to then divide X by two as well. It's not just the two Y that divides by two. This would be X over two plus Y equals 180. I bring that up. I bring that up because if X let's see would I be saying that right show that X must be even because um, that's still dividing they're saying it's an integer uh, hold on hold on hold on they never said X over 2 has to be an integer they just said that these have to be an integer um, let me see if I said that right for dividing by 2. Maybe I don't want to say dividing by 2 yet. Uh, let's do it this way. Subtract 2y over, you get x equals 360 minus 2y. The idea here is that if you double, I'm going to type this part out. Doubling any integer, doubling any integer would result in an even number. Now, I bring that up because y is one of the integers of the arc measures here, and y is doubled because there are two of them. So y being in an integer, whether you were odd or even to begin with with y, hence the case for y, uh, 2y. 360 is an even number. 
and an even number minus an even number equals an even number in x. So yeah, 360 minus 2y is taking an even number minus an even number. Maybe y itself wasn't even. Let's say y was 51 degrees. But if you double 51, you get 102. As long as y was an integer, odd or even, doubling it will turn it even, and even minus even is even, therefore x is even. I don't know if the dividing by 2 case is good for me to talk about what I wanted to say, because nothing showed that x over 2 must be an integer. They just said x must be an integer. And so I, that's what kind of stumped me when I was writing that. All right, let's go to number 21, reasoning. In circle P, the lengths of the parallel chords, and they do say they're parallel, are 20, 16, and 12. They want you to find the measure of arc AB and explain your reasoning. Oh, this little guy right there. They want that reasoning for that thing. So they said 20, 16, and 12. Uh, from the, off the bat, I'm not sure what to say, but I, I'm sure we'll come up with it in a second. So 20, 16, and 12. I probably want to do something where we're doing like perpendicular bisector bits. Um, they did say the measure of the arc though. Maybe we're gonna have to use trig. Maybe we're gonna have to use trig or special right triangles or something like that. So where my mind is leaning, where, where my head's leaning, and I'm gonna uh, copy and paste this diagram. I feel like I feel like if it was as crucial as that, they would call this a critical thinking problem. So I don't know if trig itself will actually be used. Um, I don't know. Maybe this is a long problem, or maybe there's a really easy trick and I'm not seeing it. But especially because I don't want to manipulate A and B itself. But if I do draw a perpendicular bisector to these things here, then, now I don't know if the 20, oh, the 20 will be used, right? Because if these are 20, that's the radius. That means that this is also 20 right here. So this is 20. AB was 16, excuse me, A the length, oh sorry, just this length on A was 16, so that cuts up into 8. Let's first find out what this length is. I don't need to find out the length. I need to find the central angle measure that is born from, I guess, from here to here. So I need to find this angle right here. I'm going to go ahead and use trig. I don't know if that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And I don't know if we're supposed to lean on previous things. It's just that since they didn't show anything else that's there, I'm probably, I hope I'm not thinking about this the wrong way. I hope that this is a good way that I can do it. But right here, this angle, I'm talking about this triangle right here. This angle can be solved using sine. You take the sine of the angle and you get 8 over 20. So theta is the inverse sine of 8 over 20 which is going to be some degree measure. I'll round it and stuff later. I just wanted to get that one out of the way. Now let's look at B and let's do the same idea, only this time I'm going to stretch down to this one. And let's do another right triangle here where I have theta, let's call it, I don't know, let's just call this X, where I have an X angle here. And I know that B cut in half, or the one on B, that was 12, cut in half is six. And this length is also 20 because it's still a radius. So now we're gonna find x again using inverse sine. x is the inverse sine of six over 20. Now, when I brought this thing up over here, remember that would also apply on this side. I just didn't want it to get involved in that, but whatever I find is the x right here, and whatever is x right here is also x there. Whatever theta is, is also theta there. So let me get rid of this green triangle thing to not confuse you on what the green triangle is. But x is this guy. Theta is that guy. Measure of arc AB is theta minus x. So I don't know if that's what we're supposed to do. It seems like it. There must be something else that I'm completely missing. I, I don't know that for sure. But I'm feeling like when it did, they just said reasoning, I thought they meant it wasn't a huge critical thinking problem from things we did before. So this is going to equal the inverse sine of 8 over 20 minus the inverse sine of, 16, of 6 over 20. Now let me try that in the calculator. I have to probably bring up my actual graphing calculator and see how this thing looks. So I don't know. 
If you if you want to leave in the comments section, go Mr. Robinson. You totally missed how you can do this really easily. Then I, I mean, by all means, please be my guest. Um, but you're like, no, Mr. Robinson, you're totally on point. This is how you're supposed to do it. Then great, you can do that as well. So I need to be in degrees for this thing. And I'm going to do the inverse sine. Oh, I turned it off. I'm going to do the inverse sine of 8 over 20 minus the inverse sine of 6 over 20. And that gives me this measure right here, 6.12. So measure of arc AB, I don't know what they said to round to, is about 6.12 degrees. I don't know if that sounds right or not. But I'm going with it because they're sharing those arcs and those angles. I don't know how to check for an answer on that thing. I don't even know which problem this was. What, 21? So, yeah, I, that's where I'm... Wait, did I, am I back? So, that's where I'm going with that one. I want to say it's number 21. Um, I'm hesitant on whether I want to say that for sure. I want to think on it before I tell you as a for sure that that's what I wanted. So, give me a second. Let me think on it. And then I'll uh, I'll resume play. Okay, really quickly, I don't hate my idea, but I screwed up one kind of crucial thing, and it's that this twenty was for the entire length. So this one part would just be ten for the radius. So I need to change those twenties into tens. Everywhere I see twenty, I need this thing to say ten. That includes here and here and here. So when I saw that six, the reason why I said, I don't know if this is good is because I, that angle, I, I, know, I don't know if things are supposed to be drawn to scale or not. Sometimes I think that they really are and whatever, but it just, that arc measure looked small. I expect something around 20 degrees, maybe less, whatever, but six degrees is tiny. And this six degrees is not one sixtieth of this entire circle. You know what I mean? It seemed a little off. So these are going to be tens instead. Please forgive the fact that it kind of looks a little off when I did the erasing, but those are tens. Let's do the same thing with all of those as tens and see if we get a bigger angle measure now. So I want to do the same thing in my calculator. Let's go to just turn that into 10 and that into 10. See if I like the appearance of this answer more. Okay, at least it's bigger. So I'm going to go with that. Let's say 16.26 degrees looks a little better than it did before, at least to me. So I just wrote 16.26 degrees for that. I'm going to take that one. That seems fairer that this could be about a 20th of the circle, you know, however big that it's supposed to be. Um, I'm going to go with it. I'm going to go with it. Explain your reasoning. I did some math on it. That's, that's my reasoning. All right, let's keep moving forward. Let's go to number 22. I think we have seven problems to go, but we have, we have some proofs coming up. So proving a theorem. Use congruent triangles to prove the perpendicular bisector chord, the perpendicular chord bisector theorem. I'm still kind of big on the um, not using two column proof. I, I just feel like I can make it faster by doing that, but saying things out loud. So I'm going to have to say things out loud with it, but I got to copy and paste this thing first. See, that's what bugs me, the, uh, the two column thing. I know I always gripe about it. All right, given that this is a diameter and this is perpendicular, we got to prove that these guys will be congruent to each other and that these will be congruent to each other right here. So two different parts of the proof are going to be involved with this thing. Now, it helps because, you know, you got to do the congruent triangle bits. And it's kind of in front of our faces on the congruent triangle bits. So let me say them out loud. We have congruent radii here and here. We have, by the reflexive property, this part congruent to itself. And I'm talking about LC. So I can say that LD is congruent to LF because congruent radii, all radii are congruent. I have LC congruent to itself by the reflexive property. And then I have given, um, sorry, not given. Uh, well, yeah, I have given a right angle here. So this is an HL case in right triangles. So this triangle congruent to this triangle by HL. So triangle, I'll call LCD is congruent to triangle LCF by the HL. I feel a little nauseous, actually. I might have to pause. Um, therefore, by CPCTC, I can say that segment DC is congruent to segment FC. DC congruent to FC, 
by CPCTC. Okay, now the other part I'm thinking that we can even work off the congruent angles here. So also by CPCTC, let's talk about this angle congruent to this angle, those two parts of angle L, I kind of marked them in that blue. So I can say angle DLC, I like DLC, is congruent to angle FLC, also by CPCTC, but that will help me lead into the congruent arcs. If those angles are congruent, then there are, remember these are central angles, then their arcs over here are congruent. Boom and boom from those two angles. So arc DG is congruent to arc FG because of, I don't know the name of the theorem, but just central angles that are congruent have congruent arc measures. And that would be a good case for number 22. Is that just a part A? No, that's the whole thing. But we have another proof right below in number 23, write a proof of the perpendicular chord bisector converse. So I guess this is the part B, but at least it's another problem down, knowing that we have 28 in total, we now have six problems to go. Hint, plot the center L and draw L. So we're gonna, ooh, plot the center L and draw, what? But they drew it somewhere else and it doesn't look like a center. So this is not, this is not easy for me to think about what to say here. It said, write a proof of the converse. Q has a perpendicular bisector. Prove that it's a diameter. Plot the center L. Draw a triangle LPT and LPR. So they, okay, so they kind of drew it. It's not going to look like it's in a good spot. I guess that's the point, is that we can't assume that it's on here, but we draw it anyway, and we don't go by the appearance of the drawing. We go by what's marked. Now, what's given, what's given is, congruent parts because it's a perpendicular bisector so those parts are congruent then we have a right angle here now oh I got to think of that can I use the right angle and say that L is on the right angle they said LPT and LPR I do so like here's a triangle and I can use that this is congruent to itself by the reflexive property, which is fine. I just don't know if we can use the right angle part and use that and just call it side angle side. I feel like maybe, oh, you know what? They called it a center. Even if it doesn't look like a center, they did call it a center. So they plot the center L. Because L is a center, that means that LT is a radius and LR is a radius. So LP, LP is congruent to itself by the reflexive property. Then LT, segment LT would be congruent to segment LR because they are radii. If L is a center, then they are radii. So radii are congruent in a circle. Now you have a side, side, side case of this triangle congruent to this triangle. I can call it triangle LPT and triangle LPR by side, side, side. So if it's the case of side, 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 then that means that, you know, L, L is like basically these two angles are congruent, like this guy here and this guy here. And if they're congruent and they form a linear pair, then they must be right angles. Therefore, L must be on the perpendicular bisector. So there's kind of a lot of things that I just want to kind of type out after this. Uh, so the two angle, uh, let's see. Angle TPL is congruent to, I'll say LPT, angle LPT is congruent to angle LPR by CPCTC, and they are supplementary, uh, and they form a linear pair, so they are each 90 degree right angles. Therefore, L is on the perpendicular bisector of TR known as SQ. SQ, if L is on the perpendicular bisector and L is the center, then SQ is the diameter of circle L. Is that, is that, was that the conclusion thing? QS, QS is the diameter, uh, not the diameter, a diameter, a diameter of circle L. So these angles, boom, 
congruent to angle boom. Oh, not, not equal, but congruent to angle boom. Okay, we got that. Form a linear pair, da, 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 therefore L is on the perpendicular bisector of segment TR, known as SQ. The perpendicular bisector is SQ, that's what I was trying to say. If L is on the perpendicular bisector and L is the center, then Q, SQ is a circle L. All right, there's my finishing touches of the proof. All right, let's go to number 24, thought-provoking. See, I would have thought that that tangent, whatever, or the uh, trig one that we did would have been the thought-provoking one, if that's how we do the problem best. Consider two chords that intersect at point P. Do you think that AP over BP equals CP over DP justify your answer? Well, this is something that we would look ahead to later uh, as another section thing, so I guess it's worth kind of talking about now. Let me just mark this thing up a little bit. We do have congruent angles here because they're vertical angles. Um, oh, these other things I would know the answer to. How do I say this? I would know the answer to these other things later because when we start talking about things called inscribed angles, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say anything about inscribed angles until you learn them, because I know that this angle is congruent to this one because they share the same intercepted arc AC. So I'm trying to think, if I'm not allowed to say that yet, can it, they, they said, do you think so, and explain, but that's more so like, I might be thinking ahead. This says thought provoking. It's not like you must know the answer, but I'll let you know right now that you will learn how these inscribed angles that share this same intercepted arc are congruent to each other. Therefore, these two triangles are similar by angle angle. So triangle APB, I know I'm probably speaking ahead, is similar to triangle CPD by angle angle. I mean, they said, do you think it? So I don't know. I, I'm going to say I know it. Uh, therefore, let's find parts that correspond. They said AP over BP. Look at AP and BP. And then they said CP and DP. So yes, therefore, those are corresponding parts. Therefore, AP over BP, BP uh, equals CP over DP by corresponding sides of similar triangles are proportional. That's the way that I say that one. Um, I don't know if that's what they wanted me to answer because I answered something ahead of what you're supposed to know. They are proportional though. They are proportional. All right, four more questions. Number 25, proving a theorem. Use a diagram with the equidistant chords theorem on page 592 to prove both parts of the biconditional of this theorem. So two parts to this. That's, that's uh, yeah. Let me pause the video, find that diagram, and uh, pop it up. Give me a second. Okay. So I brought this one in. I kind of had to shrink it because I wanted to write this. I wanted this part to show up. So in the same circle or congruent circles, two chords are congruent if and only if they're equidistant from the center. So the if and only if is saying that there's an original and a converse. So two chords are congruent if they are equidistant from the center. So the equidistant from the center part is what I want to lean to first. I almost want to copy and paste the diagram itself again. So let me kind of pop that one up. Let's get that. Uh, so first time through, let's say that we have the equidistance from the center. So the right angles are congruent, awesome. These two are congruent. It's kind of a given. So EG congruent to EF, given. We, we also then have radii, right? I could do something like this. I could say like, this is congruent to that. And then boom, you have two congruent triangles. Now our ultimate goal is to show that the chords are congruent. So I feel like I need to show all four triangles are congruent. Keep in mind, you have four of them. I have boom, separated, all right angles, all congruent in their own separate ways there. But yeah, all radii are congruent in this way. So Again, that's more given here. And then you have all congruent radii. Again, sorry if you know, you're know you like, well, wait, what are you supposed to write out? Wait, I, I want to write out what you write out. I'm, I'll tell you out loud. EA is congruent to EC is congruent to ED is congruent to EB because all radii are congruent in a circle. It's kind of a theorem. All congruent radii. So now I have the four congruent triangles. Now, how come? It's HL. You have right triangles in all of these. The hypotenuses are all congruent and the two sets of legs or the sets of legs are congruent. So triangle, oh boy, that's a lot of them. E, A, F is congruent to triangle E, 
BF is congruent to triangle ECG is congruent to triangle EDG by HL. Now because of this, you have these parts congruent by CPCTC. These are congruent, these are congruent, and you know, when you add, I don't really know how to kind of say it, you know, like transitive property or whatever, getting into the math part of segment addition postulate and all that, but congruent, congruent, with congruent, congruent means this whole part is congruent to this whole part. So AF is congruent to BF, but it's also, but th those two congruent things are fully congruent with CG and DG by CPCTC. Therefore, those two chords are congruent. Therefore, AB is congruent to CD. Therefore, I really want to say ergo because that can fit better. All right, there's one of the cases there. The second case is doing the converse of this. And the converse of this is to say, we have the congruent chords. We have the congruent chords here and here. And now we want to prove that these are equidistant. If you have congruent chords and the center is perpendicular to those congruent chords, if uh, a diameter, because remember EF can act as a diameter, you know, like that, a diameter that's perpendicular to a chord does bisect the chord. So let's start with the fact that we know AB is congruent to CD to begin with. Now it's bisected by the uh, perpendicular lines. So EF bisects perpendicularly, perpendicularly bisects AB and EG perpendicularly bisects, I should write it that way, CD uh, by a theorem. Okay, so there's that one, there's that one. Now this other one that we can say is because of the bisector, those congruent chords have now congruent bisected parts. This congruent to this, congruent to this, congruent to this. So a F is congruent to B F, which is congruent to C G, which is congruent to D G. That's the definition of bisector. Forget the perpendicular part, uh, but definition of bisector. What we're trying to show these are equidistant, right? Let's go back to the radii. The radii are congruent to each other. You got to kind of construct those on your own. I know it's that you might have to say draw by construction, but all congruent radii. Now you have, once again, another HL case on a different set, though. So these are all congruent, again, by HL. I'm going to, like, copy and paste that because it's literally the same triangles. Different set of HL, though, different legs that are congruent. But now these middle parts are congruent by CPCTC. So EF is congruent to EG by CPCTC. And if they're congruent, then they're equal measures. So EF equals EG by um, definition of congruence. And that would be that final answer. I know I'm slacking a little more on the proofs. You know, it's, it's kind of a long time coming for me to be able to do a lot of those in that way. Um, I will when they really say two column proof or when I really feel it's necessary. Number 26, making an argument. And sorry, when I say necessary, I mean more so like it's really a part of the nature of the problems we're doing. Like, the nature of the problem is to prove, as opposed to proving the theorems that are there. Making an argument. Oh, he probably uses the design here. A car is designed so the rear wheel is only partially visible below the body of the car, like this one. The bottom edge of the panel is parallel to the ground. So this, I think they're talking about this parallel to ground like that. Your friend claims the point where the tire touches the ground bisects AB. Is your friend correct? Explain your reasoning. Uh, I would say yeah. So... Let's get into what they're talking about. So I got a car. Here's the running part of the car like that. And then the body, I should say, where it cuts off the tire thing down here, which forms kind of a circle. But then here's the ground. Let's see. I should probably invert that. But here's car and ground and tire. Now, these are parallel, but they're also kind of horizontal, if you will. 
for these parts to be parallel with the A and B and you know all that kind of stuff and horizontal the center comes from up here somewhere and it's going to go perpendicularly down to the ground in such a way that it's also going to make these parts congruent here I'm probably arguing more logic in the math than showing the math and theorems themselves but the point of the tower touch the ground should bisect AB because Oh, you know what? Technically, this is a chord right here. Forget perpendicularly with ground. Go perpendicularly with uh, the body of the car. So it bisects that part into these two congruent parts. And if those two parts are congruent, then these two parts are congruent. So yes, that would work out in that way. I think that's the best way to explain it there. So the, a, uh, the diameter, and I, I quote diameter because I didn't draw a full one would intersect the car and ground perpendicularly, thus bisecting both the chord of AB and the arc of AB. Friend is correct. Okay. All right, I got two more questions, no more proofs. Wait, was that it? No, 26, wait. Am I missing a page? I might be missing a page here. Um, wait, did we only go to 26? Oh, we only go to 26. I thought we were going to 28. I was not looking at that thing that entire time. All right, guys, that ought to do it for this one. This is Mr. Robinson. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next one. On, I think I'm doing a 10, 1 to 10, 3 quiz review. I think that's what comes up next in the textbook. And then 10.4. These things kind of go out of order for me. I'm not really seeing the connection, the leap from one to the other. I did see where we use central angles here, so I guess. But uh, I think naturally I would teach these a different way. But that's totally okay. Totally works. But we're going to review what we did so far here. Not that they're the only things that relate. There are a lot more things with chords we're going to do. We're going to learn those inscribed angles, I'm sure. We're going to talk about circles on graphs and all that. But guys, take care for this one. I will see you in the next one.